Hi, my name is Mike Dillard, and this is Self Made Man, the podcast for men who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of their lives. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. Today, we are joined by none other than Robert Hirsch, my former business partner and best friend for the past eight years. And a little story for you on how we met. It was originally through a mutual friend of ours when I was looking to hire a scaling coach for my first company many years ago. So I flew out to Denver to meet Robert for the first time at his home office. And when he opened the door, we were wearing the exact same shoes, the same jeans, and the same designer shirt, but in a different color, which basically set the tone for the rest of our relationship over the past decade. Robert is one of the smartest people you will ever meet. He's in his early 40s, but... If you talk to him, it kind of seems like he's lived three or four lifetimes with the amount of stories and experiences this guy has accumulated. So today, we've decided to dive into the challenges that entrepreneurs face when they're making the transition from a one-person shop to hiring their first level of management to begin that scaling process, as that is one of the most awkward and challenging transitions every entrepreneur will have to make. Now, we also dive into one of the most valuable lessons that we've learned while working together, which is how to turn your company into a giant magnet for talent and opportunity so that people are literally knocking on your door asking to work for you. This is definitely a valuable episode, so please help me welcome Mr. Robert Hirsch. Well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Mike Dillard here. And today we've got a really special episode for you guys because... We're going to be talking to, and I'm going to be interviewing my best friend and business partner, Mr. Robert Hirsch. So, Robert, welcome to Self Made Man, brother. Mike, thank you so much for having me, brother. It is a pleasure to be here. We go back about seven or eight years now, and we had our biggest run together the last the last couple of years mm -hmm. uh, in business. And our relationship actually started with me hiring you as a as my uh, business coach way back when during the magnetic sponsoring days. And, and then we went to work together after that. But uh, I'm, I'm really excited that we finally got you on the show. And I would love it if you would start out by giving a little bit of your background story, which is fascinating. <laughs> you guys uh, you guys are going to love the, the stories Robert has to share with you because I, I know them all. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, brother, glad you're here and uh, that you're here to share all of your wisdom and experience that you have with everybody. And we're going to be talking about how to really avoid all of the pitfalls that most entrepreneurs tend to fall into, the landmines we tend to step on, and then how can you basically put yourself in a position to where you can go out and achieve your biggest, wildest goals and dreams when it comes to your career as an entrepreneur. So that's going to be the theme and the topic for today. But Robert, if you could take us back to way back when, how did you get your start as an entrepreneur? Well, you know, Mike, I, I, I became an entrepreneur before I knew how to spell it, uh, literally. You know, it, it, it was interesting. A lot of entrepreneurs, I suppose, uh, choose entrepreneurship. For me and for you, we didn't really love our station in life. And uh, nobody would hire me for a job I wanted to do. So, you know, we had a marathon that went by our house that I set up a, you know, a coffee shop in elementary school and, uh, you know, out front of there and I mowed lawns and I was a paper boy. And then when I was in middle school, I had two paper routes and, you know, and then I had a couple of little jobs, McDonald's and the pizza place. And then when I was 16, um, I had this job at this outdoor festival in Portland, Oregon called Portland Saturday Market. And uh, it was setting up, you know, the big food tent on Saturday morning and tearing it down Sunday night and emptying some garbage cans every couple hours. But what was great was you get paid for 30 hours for a weekend's work, which was an awful lot in high school. And I was working with my best fr friend at the time doing this job. And we walked by this, this shop and he sold $150 worth of beads. And it was 1990. It was May of 1990. So anyway, we, um, we looked at each other and we said, we can do that. And uh, on June 10th, we opened our first little shop. And by the time we had you know graduated high school, we had... We had multiple little shops. Uh, we had six of them. And when I say shops, I mean a 10 by 10 easy up. I don't mean to overstate it. It was the first time I really had financial freedom in my life. And, uh, and it ruined me for a straight job. When did you get your first car? 
<laughs> you know that you know it's funny because no other interviewer would ever know to ask me that question. <laughs> uh, and so you know, when I was a kid, I, I you know I raced go karts and remote controlled cars and pretty much anything that went fast. And and I was fourteen, and this one guy that was older at the at the track offered to trade me my go kart for his full size nineteen seventy eight Ford Fiesta. And then he looked at me and he's like, "You're sixteen, right?" And I'm like, "Oh, of course." And I could only tell this because the statute of limitations has run out. So I bought the car. I was 14 years old. And I parked it at the church parking lot, caddy corner, to my house. And, you know, I didn't drive it every day. But I had it for a couple of years. And uh, I remember, um, I, I think you've heard this story from my mother before. But uh, I got caught about two and a half years after having the car. And, 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 you know, the police officer picked me up and said, license and registration. And I said, well, that's an interesting story. And she, she looked at me when she was picking me up. She said, how long have you had that car? And, and I said, just a couple of weeks. It was very enterprising, but I needed to get to where I needed to go. So I now have a son, and if I get what I deserve, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> you know, it's, I think, just indicative uh, or indicative of the entrepreneur's mindset where if I have a problem, I'll find a solution. And, um, yeah, it's a perfect example of that. So what did you do? After you left high school, did you go to go to college? What was that path like for you? Yeah, so it, it, it was pretty bumpy. You know, so we started Rob's Head of Beads. It turns out that, um, and then we opened a shop in Fandel Hall. I went to uh, what was at the time the number one entrepreneurial school in the country. I went to Babson, uh, and I lasted a whole semester. And uh, I opened up this shop in Fandel Hall, and I learned this important lesson uh, that beads sell better in Oregon than they do in Boston, or they didn't. They did in the, in the early 1990s. And so um, I, I, I went there. I started a bunch of businesses. A few were successful. Many were not. But, you know, as entrepreneurs, we learn our lessons. And we can learn them either fast or slow. And, uh, you know, you, you think of the bell curve distribution and people talk about income distribution with entrepreneurs. And, and it, it's almost a, an inverse bell curve. Or it's almost where, where you have a bunch of people that haven't figured it out and a bunch of people that figured it out. So at that point, I, uh, I hadn't figured it out. I went out, to, I went out to Vail for spring break. I never went back. I ended up going to, uh, to school at the University of Colorado Boulder. Loved it. Went to Silicon Valley. Ended up raising venture capital on the back of a napkin. Started an early search engine. I did venture back companies for four companies for seven rounds for nine years to realize it wasn't what I wanted to do. And the reason that it wasn't what I wanted to do is, is you see the way these things end up. And, and especially when you start off as a young entrepreneur, you have absolutely no clue what these legal terms mean uh, that are being thrown around by the venture capitalists. Now, that being said, I had some that were very aggressive in deal terms and others that were very fair in deal terms. So it's really who you're dealing with. But you don't figure out what warrants and options and escalators and bridge loans are until the end. And uh, it seems like you're doing all the work and it seems like the lion's share of the profits are going to the other side. And so that didn't make a ton of sense. So well, let's, let's, um, if you don't mind, let's dive into that because I know sure. it wasn't a very happy ending for you as far as that goes. And I think there's some infinitely valuable lessons or words of wisdom that you could, you could share with everyone around that. So, you know, essentially, um, you know, and, and many entrepreneurs, you know, I worked 70 to 80 hours a week, as you know, in some ways I traded health for wealth. We worked, you know, and if you take venture capital, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs are, they think about things. It was funny, I was just talking with a young entrepreneur that's an operating head of one of the companies, and he talked about, he talked about having majority ownership or 51%. That was very important to him. Most entrepreneurs don't understand what preferred shares are and common shares are. But the moment you take an investor in a two-class of stock situation, it's the moment that you don't control your company if if things don't work out well. And that being said, you know I had some good, you know I had some good singles, you know in the in the venture back community, and I'm I've always been more of a contact hitter, singles than doubles, more so than home runs. But I think there are a lot of lessons around it. But what I counsel entrepreneurs around raising money, a lot of people think. Raising money is free money. And, and frankly, it was the first time people gave me millions of dollars that I didn't have to pay back. But that comes with a really steep price, whether you realize it or you don't. And so if you have the opportunity to bootstrap it or to self-fund as opposed to raising money, to me, that is always preferable. 
And I know Mike with with our current business endeavor, you know, we go through that struggle. We go through that struggle right now. You know, sure. do, yeah. And raising money, you know, and 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 you really need to find the right investors, and you want to make sure that that term sheet is really a tool for growth. And if structured correctly, it, it can be. But I think if any entrepreneur is thinking about raising money and they don't know what the terms mean, and, and those terms actually explain pretty simple concepts. It's just meant to opacify or obfuscate what they're trying to say so the entrepreneur doesn't know. And so, you know, taking a you know taking some time and really understanding contracts and becoming literate with legalese just as you need to be literate with financials is so important but especially if you're going to be raising money from the outside mm. yeah absolutely so after your um you know your stint in, in silicon valley the good the bad and the ugly that was involved with that where did you go next i started my own fund so we started our own fund, and this was back on the first South Fork Ventures, and that was the only one that I ever had LPs or investors in. And I, I liked having the fund and being able to take an entrepreneur's take on investing, but I didn't love the limited partners. So it turned out with the, with the second fund, we ended up acquiring a company uh, with a forum member out of, my, uh, out of my old EO forum or YEO forum. We ended up acquiring a company, and that... You know, that turned into such a cash cow, we used the funds from that to fund other acquisitions. So we've really been doing mergers, acquisitions, turnarounds, and, you know, 90, 99% of my wealth has been generated from buying, operating, or selling small businesses. I mean, small in the classical definition, not as in the businesses are small, but what I, I really mean is high growth lifestyle companies, you know, like what we did at Elevation Group. Yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. So when did you start to do the consulting stuff, which you did for a little bit, and that's how we met? Yeah, so the consulting and coaching, you know, it's interesting. I, I, um, I remember the first time I was ever exposed to a high-level consultant or coach, I, I think he, it was at a, in an old YEO forum or Young Entrepreneurs Organization forum, and we were bringing in a guy, and it was for, I don't know, our forum was six or eight people, and I don't know what he cost. It was the early 2000s. And he, he was, you know, like a $5,000 facilitator. And I'm thinking in my head, what is this guy going to do for five grand? You know, show me this magical backflip. And uh, he came in and he absolutely blew my mind. And all of a sudden, I became a sponge for growth. And I would go out and pay anybody that I could learn from. You know, I would pay anybody that told me they could learn, that I could learn from them. And so, you know, the interesting thing is, once I figured it out, a lot of my failures were early in my entrepreneurial career. And then once I figured it out, you know, we, we've got a pretty good on base percentage, if that makes sense. And that's why I, I often talk about there's two types of entrepreneurs, those that have figured it out and those that haven't. And helping other entrepreneurs figure it out is really the most important thing. I mean, when, when you think about what, what limits your growth, you know, there was an old expression out of Alcoholics Anonymous that is your best thinking got you here. And, you know, they'll, they'll tell you, you know, that when you're at the bottom. And you remember I said that in kind of the opening presentation on Necker Island when we were on Necker. But your best thinking gets you there. And that really helps, you know, I define an entrepreneur as someone that takes accountability for their actions. And if you take accountability for your actions, whether you do it within the, another organization as an entrepreneur or, or for yourself as an entrepreneur, that shifts your mindset really significantly. And if you... If you take accountability for your actions, then you control your results and you create your reality. You know, that to me was always the, the life shifting, the life shifting piece. And so when, when that really clicked for me, I started doing coaching and consulting. And I, and, and by the way, I still work with a couple people, but it's really people that I love. And the reason that we do it is, is the skills that get you from one to 5 million are very different. And in fact, they're juxtaposed than the skills that get you from five to 50. And it's really the shift of working in your business where you're the smartest guy in the room and there's no wall you can't run through to working on your business where you're creating systems and processes that allow you to grow. And you also create the, the measurements to, you know, you can't manage what you can't measure. And so that's how you build, the, you know, the lean operating machine. And, 
you know that that shift is a big one and i know that's what what we worked on together and and really in all my consulting engagements it's always the same shift some people you know some people get stuck on it for a while mike you plowed through really every plateau of growth as fast as anyone i've ever worked with yeah thank you kind of <laughs> i'm still <laughs> no, working I'm, on them but uh as are, as are we all well let's know? go i mean let's go let's go through that let's let's dive in right like sure. Where where's the first place that you tend to start with a new company that you know was in the same place mine was in where I'm the guy, yeah, and I'm trying not to become the guy and I'm trying to go from a million dollars a year to let's say ten million dollars dollars a year. What needs to be in place, and what mistakes need to be avoided in order to successfully do that? Well, you know that it's that's a that's the only question that really matters, and it's a pretty complex one. But I'll start with where I would start with the new company, which is with the CEO and the founder. So I'll use you as the example, because your readership obviously is very familiar. And so I, I have a model that I call the stupid human trick. And you remember the pre-work before we did our first session, you know, you did your Myers-Briggs, you did your Colby, you did, you know, your personal DNA. You, you know, we, we did as much both cognitive and cognitive testing as we can, but it was really figuring out what the stupid human trick is. And what I mean by a stupid human trick is think back to we, when we were kids, right? And we played video games, uh, you know, and, and back when I played video games, there was like one or two buttons. There's not the 30 buttons on the controller that there are now. And all the characters, they would have like one standard move, you know, they'd punch or kick and then they'd have a special move. You know, this guy does a backflip. This guy breathes fire. This guy does blankety blank. Well, in business, it turns out that usually in my case, in your case, we all have that stupid human trick, that one thing that creates value. And Mike, you know, I remember, I don't remember how long it was, so the number might be wrong, but you're the only person before we ever started working together, you wrote me a 13 to 15 page letter before we started working together. And you're such an exceptional writer and a fabulous, you know, a fabulous interview and great on video. You know, that was always your stupid human trick. That was always how how you created value, but there were a lot of other things you were doing. You were marketing, doing email sequences, you were doing a whole bunch of other pieces. So at that point, what I, what I work on first with the CEO is getting very clear on what's a stupid human trick and taking first rough grit sandpaper and then finer sandpaper on getting really clear on what's the thing that you do that delivers, you know, all the value, you know, and most people know the 80, 20 principle, you know, meaning 80% your 20% of your work is developing is delivering 80% of your results. I really think when you're getting to an expert level, it turns into 95, five, meaning 5% of your work is doing 95%. So then, you know, what we try and do is eliminate all the other things that you have to do on a daily repetitive basis and really create space around your stupid human trick. There was an old Kabbalist concept called Zimzum, spelled T-Z-I-M, or T-Z-I-M, T-Z-U-M, two words. And it's around the creation of space. And it's really around the creation of space for your stupid human trick to be able to, to fulfill your time. You remember uh, there was one client that you introduced me for in, or you introduced me to in the firearms industry. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember when I was doing it with him, and he's a big kind of strong alpha male guy. And uh, we started to clear the space and he would call me up in his office because he was sitting on his hands and going crazy. He's like, I feel like I'm not doing anything. You know, of course, with his company, he had, you know, 10x growth. But if you allow your stupid human trip to fill your time, that allows you to create really disproportionate value. And the way that quantitatively uh, I'd represent it, and this is, you know, represent on a board, just think about it from an 80-20 perspective, right? If 20% of your time creates 80% of your value... How do you do that 20% five times to create 400% of your value? And that's really how you shift the line or create multiplicative growth as opposed to moving up and down the line or additive or subtractive. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, I think one of the biggest things that is unbelievably important to know as well is where do you ultimately want to end up? Because I had a, I, you know, I just had a conversation a week or two ago with a very successful seven-figure entrepreneur that I've known for many years, and and we talked about his business and and where it's going. And you know, the one surprising thing for for him is that he didn't really have a plan that went beyond the immediate present, and let's say the next six months. 
Mm-hmm. And we were talking about, well, where do you want to end up three to five years from now? Because none of us are getting any younger. And we're getting to a point, I know you and I are kind of both on this same path where, you know, I've, I only want to do this one or two more times and then I, I want to be done. But in order to do that, you have to have a long-term vision for that and you have to backwards engineer it so that every single action you're taking today will move you towards accomplishing that goal three to five years from now. But most people don't have that. And I think that's a, that's a huge, huge problem. It is, right? And so kind of the center of my vision book is this truth for me, which is thought equals word equals manifestation. Meaning what you think becomes what you say becomes what you create or you manifest. And, you know, the burden of that is, is, of course, control your thoughts. Like as soon as you figure that out, you know, it becomes really easy to kind of stomp out those negative thoughts and what that looks like. But I think, you know, going back to one of my favorite books, Alice in Wonderland, if you don't know where you're going, any road will do. And there's so many of us, you know, I know for me and I know for you, we started off running from pain. And that's why we worked so hard. You know, we didn't really have an option. When people ask me the question, they're like, you know, how did you get the initiative to start a business? I'm like, I had no choice. And so sometimes when you start off running from something, you know, it's easy to talk about what you're running towards. But there's a point in an entrepreneur's life, kind of a, you know, a halftime, if you will. And, and you know, for, for both of us, sports were always really important. But the, comp- you know, the team that would usually win you know, the football game was the one that would make the best adjustments at halftime. And so as an entrepreneur, once you achieve some level of financial freedom or escape immediate pain or whatever your thresholds are, you know, at that point, we have to ask, you know, where are we going and how are we going to get there, right? And so as entrepreneurs, we know where we are really well, but being able to pull out of out of your day-to-day business, you know, and see the forest through the trees and also, you know, this is where working with an awesome consultant you know, and, 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 and there's lots of consultants and the reality is you want to find someone that, that you really resonate with and resonates with you, but getting somebody that's not attached to the outcome to help you in a goal setting perspective on the consulting side, the process that we did, you know, there's four quarters and the first quarter was hope something to be full of. That's where you set your goals. You, you figure out where you want to be, what you want your days to look like. The second quarter is the hardest and we call that change. And, uh, the expression for that was sucks now, different later. And, you know, that's when, that's when the client is sitting on his hands saying, I feel like I have nothing to do in his office, you know, and then you get to progress and that's kind of like change only better. And finally, you know, manifest inspired to do it. Well, that's when you're, you know, the, the engine's running cool and lean and mean. And there are so many, there are so many pieces for me, there's, you know, a lot of goal setting and, and, and Mike, to come back to your question, you know, there was, uh, I remember there was. A prospective client, we were meeting each other, and you know, it's got to work on both sides for it to work for anybody. And I, I asked him what his goals are. He's like, I don't really believe in goals. And I, my response was, well, then this isn't going to work because that's you know, kind of one of my tenets. But I, I believe you create your reality by what you focus on, and, and, and both consciously and subconsciously. You know, that's why you know, entrepreneurs, right, again, we, you know, we're going to learn our lessons faster. We're going to learn them slow. But it wasn't until just a few years ago when, you know, I kind of took my foot off the gas and concluded the operational side of my career. In fact, EVG was my last CEO role. It wasn't until I took my foot off the gas that way that I ever read a fiction book because every book I read was business related. And with the possible exception of Atlas Shrugged, which is also business related, just a little bit more tangential. But I, I mean, working on yourself and creating, you know, an awesome knowledge base to be able to you know, create your reality. You know, people, you know, people always talk about a million dollar idea. And, and I often talk from stage about the myth of a million dollar idea. You know, I say, what's the difference between a million dollars and, and a million dollar idea? And, and some of the questions that you get to that are amazing. But to me, it's million dollar execution. And what people don't realize, just like racing a car, is it's a learnable, teachable skill. And you learn one step at a time. But so often, we either get blinded by the light. We don't realize that we have to put one foot in front of the other to get there. And that's why resources like Self Made Man and some of the products out there, like your products, are invaluable. So, you know, setting your, making sure you know where you're going, I I would say is, is rule number one. What are some of the 
next biggest mistakes that you see startups making where it's like, okay, yep, this, this oh. is, this is common. Let's go ahead and, and fix this. You know, let's just go down the line, right? So you got the CEO and the founder, um, you know, and, and really what I focus there is what is the one thing they've done that's allowed them to create disproportionate success? For example, your marketing abilities. And then we, we isolated you to that and got everything else, got rid of everything else. And the second part of that, right after that, come to the team. I remember when I met you in your first business, you know, a lot of the, the you know, the, the executive team that you recruited were your friends. And some of them, you know, you know, everyone, good entrepreneurs, smart guys, but you weren't going out in terms of trying to find the best people for the business. You were using trust as your, as your currency and you were just trying to backfill it as fast as you, as you can. And that's a mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make. And, you know, it comes down to how do you put the best team on the field, right? How do you put the best team on the field and you get the right people on the bus? And there's an internal team and an external team, you know, whether you're outsourcing them, whether you're hiring them, but it's also, you know, who's your banker, who's your lawyer, you know, who are the resources that you need to get this done? Because nobody can do it all themselves. I mean, it doesn't matter. I've been doing this for 26 years. I'm not even close. I, you know, I, I just know what I'm good at and I outsource the rest. And so it's getting the right people there. And then the key to that, to me, and, and is mission and values. You know, how do you create a mission? Like what we did at the Elevation Group, right? We were educating the middle class on the strategies of the ultra wealthy. Well, I think that's, I think that was a, a huge learning experience for both of us. And the fact that, uh, when you have a super authentic, genuine mission, and, and those two words are key, authentic and genuine, yeah. Yeah. you know, that starts at the top and is real. It's not just a tagline. Then it is really an absolute magnet for bringing people onto the bus, if you will. Mm -hmm. and bringing them onto the team. So, I mean, we both came to that same conclusion where it, it was it was a huge epiphany where it's like, you don't need to worry about recruiting. You know, you just need to worry about being authentic about your goals and your mission. And if you do that, people will be attracted to it who are of, of like mind and passion, and they'll want to participate. And the difference is so stark. Like, you can remember, you know, a lot of the speaking engagements and when we were getting people on the bus, Right. You know, I'd go up and there'd be other speakers and they'd be selling crap from stage, which, and not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just not my deal. And, you know, they'd be, hey, if you get one of the 10 programs in the back of the room, you know, and we'd get up there and we'd talk about what we're doing and why. And we had, an, we had a, a significant amount of our employees would come up to us after they heard me speak and they're like, I'll work for you for free. And we didn't let them work for free for long. But we did test it out a little bit, <laughs> and uh, but you know if you and, and if you have people that are coming because of an align, uh, alignment and mission and values, the good news is you don't you don't need uh, they're going to stay with you because they're aligned and you're on a common goal, and it, you, you don't really it all lines up very naturally and organically, and so that's such a huge magnet to attract the right people to you. You know, along those lines, one of the biggest challenges out there, uh, especially for me, has always been letting people go. You know, one of the traits of my personality type is that I tend to avoid conflict. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to firing people or even having the tough t discussions with teammates in the, in the company, that's a huge challenge. But you've had some really good rules of thumb that I think were were super valuable, uh, you know, during the, the last company. And, and I think people would benefit from hearing those right now. I used to, you know, I used to hate doing that too. I mean, how can you not, right? They're, they're people and their feelings and their families and, and it's business. But, you know, one of the realizations and it was, and it was kind of like dating when you were trying to find the right woman. If you have to ask the question, then you know the answer. You know, and by the time I thought about firing somebody, they'd been thinking about quitting for six months. You know, and uh, they'd been walking for six weeks. You know, it, it was it was crazy, and they'd already thought of it. You'd already thought of it. You know, but I it, I it was always the last person to realize that, and that's a good litmus test. And but you and I are, and and you know, the old expression: you want to be quick to fire and slow to hire. But you know, I I don't exactly do that anymore. And I, I know I know you and I, when we find the right people, you know, we take them with us forever, and that's why we have a lot of shared team. And so, you know, the reality is you probably pay a 10 to 30% premium for, 
for being a little bit more generous. And I think you and I have always been generous with everybody in our lives. And I'm totally okay going through my career that way. But by the time you, you think you should fire somebody, they know it, you know it, and it just hasn't been communicated yet. So often when you bring it up, it's, it's a relief. Were there some others that you were thinking of as well? Oh, you know, the big one, the big one is for me, if you have to ask yourself the question, you already know the answer. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, that just, that's just applicable in a ton of, you know, different areas. So yes. I think that's really important. And then, you know, the other one that I always go back to as well is how do you make sure that you are not just a piece you, you know, that your, your vision is sure. bigger than being a piece uh, in, a, in a game, if you will. So what is your model around that? Right. So, and, and this was, um, and it's a question that I often lead with when I meet an entrepreneur. So, you know, both you and I play a little bit of chess and I, I often say, hey, if you were a piece on the chessboard, what would you be? And 90% of the time I get, so, you know, I, I get one of two answers, right? So think about it, right? The Joe blogs or the expected answer is the king or the queen, right? And the rationale is the queen can go anywhere, you know, do anything, go in any direction as far as she wants, um, the most powerful offensive piece. And the king, you know, if, if you lose the king, you lose the game, right? So generally people think of one of those two. And ironically, sometimes you get some other responses as well. You know, you get that 10%. Entrepreneurs are a quirky breed, right? So you get... You know, I want to be the knight because you know, they're unpredictable or I want to be the rook or, uh, but usually you get the king or the queen. And so, and this is really, this is really the secret sauce of South Fork um, or South Fork Ventures and the, and the consulting, which is how do you transition from wanting to be the king or the queen? Because by the way, that's the smartest guy in the room, zero to $5 million answer. And the, and the answer to this is a little bit tricky, but the, the way you go from five to 50 is you become the board. And what I mean by that is you transition to the board and then you create a game worth winning for, and so you can recruit kings or queens. Because so many businesses are stifled by you being the king or the queen on your board and you keep, want, and you keep hiring people that want to be kings and queens and you keep putting them in rooks and bishop positions. And just because you call a chicken a duck doesn't make it a duck. And so... You've got these guys that want to be kings or queens, and you're putting them, you know, in kind of a second-tiered operational position. And so it's really rare that you're going to find me on the org charts of most of my companies. And that's really how you do transition to the board and bring in kings and queens. You know, most people want to be at the top of the org chart. So let somebody do that. And, you know, that comes, you know, that comes at the time of an entrepreneur's life when 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 you figured it out and you want to be able to be the board in multiple games, because there are certain things that, you know, for example, when you, when you and I have challenges, uh, you know, there are certain times that, you know, being able to lean on our years of entrepreneurial experience and not only that, our network, you know, when I have problems, you know, you're the first person I call and vice versa, but being able to leverage it and become the board and then bring the kings and queens and create the game worth winning. There's a little bit of a secret sauce to that as well, which is going back to the, you know, if you don't know where you're going, how do you create a game for them that is really exciting to climb the ladder? I mean, if you study companies, like if you study the old, the old pay scale and partnership network at the big investment banks like Goldman Sachs, it's the greatest motivational game ever devised. I mean, it's just, it's beautiful. So how do you create a game that's worth winning for an operational team to be able to backfill your position? Because that's really the key to being able to go from that zero to five to five to 50, or it's really the, you know, what, what corporate America would call the transition from first line to second line management. But that is really that key to growth. And, and once you get up into that, once you get up into that earnings level, uh, the multiples and the company value really become life changing. And, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, entrepreneurs want to make sure that the money that the value that they're creating and the money that they're receiving is enough to set their, their company up. Um, you know, it, it was implied in your statement earlier, Mike, when, when you said, I'm only looking to do this one or two more times, meaning you want to make sure you build a bridge to the other side of the water, not a pier in the middle of a lake. Right. 
And so there's so many entrepreneurs. And so once you get up to that level, you're really, you're in the bridge building mode. You're not in the, in the peer building mode. So that's such a, that's such a huge chunk. But if you think about it, if you're the king or your queen in your business, and you want to, and, 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 and that being the board really resonates, that's really the spot where, and historically that's the spot where I've helped. But that transition to the board is so critical in an entrepreneur's life. And uh, when you do it, the good news is, is it's easier on the other side. The bad news is, is letting go uh, can be quite painful. Yeah, no, Absolutely. You know, something that I'm, I'm thinking about as I'm uh, hearing you talk real quick is that you and I are both also very good and we've seen a lot of value in creating magnets in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the really big one that I created, you know, I think most recently was the mission around EBG and my, and my passion for that mission. And that really is what brought all of our team members onto the bus when we were, when we were growing that company. So that was a a huge magnet from a business perspective, you know, from, from the current stuff that I'm working on now, obviously self-made man and the mission here has been a huge magnet for everybody who's li been listening and the audience, uh, and the goodwill that, that has come from this podcast. And then with the hydroponics business, once again, the mission and the story around the creation of that company and the product is just serving as a giant magnet to bring people into my life and the business that I've never met before uh, at an unbelievably higher level than I'm already at because they're excited about it and they believe in it. And then you've been very good at applying the same principle when it comes specifically. I mean, I think the strongest example that I can think of right now is, uh, is your home in Basalt mm -hmm. and how you've really leveraged that as a giant magnet to bring, you know, amazing people into your life on a, on a weekly basis. So if you wouldn't mind, Talk a little bit about that strategy, what that's been like for you, you know, having the home there and how, you know, it's benefited you. Sure. I mean, there's been two things, right? And uh, the transition was really having a family and children. Because as you know, my wife and I used to travel together all the time and often with you. You know, once we started having kids and our first hunter was born, then I had a choice. I, you know, a lot of my traveling, uh, you know, I, I, I've used to travel a couple hundred nights a year and, and I don't want to do that with, with my wife and my family and what that looks like. So we essentially run a, a bed and breakfast uh, just outside of Aspen and uh, we don't rent it. We just do it for our friends. But as I tell Steph um, or my wife, sometimes when she, sometimes when she says, God, we have people here all the time, it's either they can come here or we can go there. But, you know, kind of a common principle you know, when you talk about the magnet, and, and I love your frame, Be the Cheese, and I'd love to get back and ask you the question on, on explaining that, because I think that really helped me shape my thinking around it. But with the house, we have a place in the mountains on the river on one of the best fly fishing destinations in the country. And, and when we bring people up here, it's, you know, it's a pretty fun, beautiful life. And this is where we spend our summers and most of the year. And so we can either go to them or they can come to us. So we live in an area... You know, most people love to come to Aspen um, in the winter and the summer. So it's pretty easy. And it also changes the frame from, you know, a, an office or a cubicle or an offical type environment. It, it was never really conducive or really resonated with me authentically anyway. So it's been really effective. I know I, I've enjoyed it, although the only, the only downside of it is we don't have quite the proximity that we used to. Yeah, no, it's just been, it's been such a big difference maker. And I think one of the very first times the light bulb went off for you and I was when we went to Necker for the first time. Yeah. And we realized like, holy smokes, this is Branson's giant piece of cheese and his magnet where literally the most talented people in the world come to his home to spend a week with him at a time and just hang out and all kinds of business gets done and ideas get get communicated and the world comes to him. And so that's something that I would encourage everybody who's listening to this to think about, which is how can you create a magnet in your life? Again, it could be intangible in the form of a mission, or it can be tangible in the form of a destination or home, or, you know, whether it's a world-class office or an amazing home, uh, you know, whatever it may be. I know, I know there's a couple of people here in Austin who've, you know, purchased houses on the lake or in the hills 
uh, with that specific purpose in mind. And they have mastermind meetings there and, and they do stuff like that. But it just it gets used as a, a tool for attraction. I think it's unbelievably powerful. So there's also a social there's a social element to it as well where you bring it in. But it also it establishes a certain level of credibility, which is always good. And and Mike, you know, ever, you know, you, you know, one of the phrases and the frames that I learned from you that has been so valuable, and I think you and I both live it, but do you mind explaining your, your be the cheese analogy? Yeah, maybe you're thinking of it in a way, in a way that I don't, but I mean, this, this is a result of me trying to compensate for the fact that, uh, you know, for the most part, I'm a level 10 out of 10 introvert. <laughs> and unless I know you or you're a personal friend of mine, I don't really uh, like to interact with people that I don't know. And that's a traditional introvert quality because interacting with people is uh, is a huge energy drain for an introvert because you put out so much energy and if you don't think there's going to be an ROI from it or if the conversation is dull or boring, if I don't think I'm ever going to see this person again in my life, then it's just a horrible investment in my time and energy. So that is, uh, it just is what it is and it's how I'm wired. And so at the same time, I have to go out and I do have to meet people. And the only two real catalysts for change or growth or improvement in your life or business is either new information or new people and new relationships. So it's still a requirement, but instead of going out and chasing after people, whether they're prospects or business partners or, you know, uh, team members or whatever it may be, I've just found that it's infinitely easier and more effective if you just position yourself as the cheese, which traditionally is, uh, I guess, best summed up as a source of value, than, uh, than to go after and chasing people where you are the one who really is positioned in a manner who has no value and, and no power. So is that, is that the way that you were, you would sum oh, it yeah. up as well? Or? Yeah, it is. And, 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 but you would always bring people to you, you know, your first book, Magnetic Sponsoring, really changed, uh, an industry, which is kind of like training wheels for entrepreneurs. But instead of going out to people, you taught people to come to you. And, you know, that's been a common theme really in both of our lives. And I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure it's something that we, you know, we both continually learn, you know, from each other. But the, the big, you know, the big piece for me is you, you would help people. So if somebody partnered with you, then they would co-author your book or whatever the case may be, which you would always have a big piece of cheese out for anybody that wanted to work with you, which was a, which was a great, you know, introverts trick to, you know, to the world. And, uh, when we really, I remember that conversation that we had on Necker when we realized that Necker was just Branson's piece of cheese for these really interesting, curious people to, to come. And, uh, and, and both you and I are expired, are inspired by that in the next, you know, phase of our lives. But, you know, as we go from the guy doing it to the guy getting it done, or how do we, you know, what does the next phase of our career look like in terms of how do you, you know, entrepreneurial education is one of the biggest problems that I think we face in our industry um, every day. I mean, it's entrepreneurial education. Anyway, you slice it as it's kind of a fail. And there's a lot of things that you and I know that would really help young entrepreneurs and how do you get it out there in a way that you can affect as many people as you can. You know, I know for the next stage, I know that's something that's very important to me and I know it's near and dear to your heart too. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, with that in mind, I just, I just took a, a look at the clock. We've got about 10 minutes left. Yep. What would you like to share with everybody listening uh, when it comes to, to business? Either, either what, has been your biggest, most costly mistake that you would suggest people avoid? Or what has been uh, your biggest win and that you would recommend that they, they follow? So if there's only one thing to take away from the call, you know, this, this is it. And it's really starting with the end in mind. And what I mean by that, right now my, my primary business is Raincatcher. And we consult with companies and buy and help entrepreneurs buy and sell companies. There's never really been an efficient marketplace for that. There are so many entrepreneurs that think about selling their company and they, and they you know, have this one question in their mind, that, you know, what is my company worth? And you know, the amount of times that people ask me the question of what are the primary drivers of value for my company? I've been doing this 
For example, I was talking to a, a friend the other day, and he wanted us to help sell his chain of barbecue restaurants. I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he's like, what are the big drivers of value? And I'm thinking in my head, and this is a 23-year-old business. I'm like, you've been doing this for 23 years, and you don't know how you're going to get valued at the end. I mean, you're just kind of putting one foot in front of the other in the hopes that you're getting to the promised land, but you don't really know. And so to me, goal setting and really starting with the end in mind, meaning are, are you building your business to have a lifestyle thing? Are you building your business to pass on to your children? Are you building your business to sell uh, at some point? And if so, what is that point? Is that when growth is plat plateaued? Or as you stated earlier, is that when you built a bridge to the other side? You know, what, is that, what does that look like? What do you want your company to be? And, you know, for example, I just went through these questions with Raincatcher, but we're not, you know, we're not building Raincatcher, we're not building Raincatcher to sell. It's, it's really a muse to help entrepreneurs with the biggest transaction in their life. And it's what I want to do. That's what retirement looks like to me. And do you want to retire to something or from something? Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking it's, uh, it's been an interesting theme for those of us who've been on our entrepreneurial paths for you know, roughly the same period of time. Let's just say for me, it's, it hasn't been as long, but it's been about 10 years. And there's a lot of other people in the industry who've been uh, friends of mine and colleagues for around the same period. And we've all built, se you know, multiple seven or eight figure businesses. And yet none of us are done from a, from a financial perspective. You know, we've made money, we've spent money, we've lost money, we've made more money. And we're starting to realize that there's definitely in a a lot of value and a lot of <laughs> a lot of incentive to spend your time building businesses that there is a, the potential for an exit attached to and so for my particular story uh you know in let's just call it the the educational industry where I'm the teacher and or the leader can't sell my businesses cuz the reason people purchase from me is because of me and the relationship that they have with me. So there's no ending to that. It is a treadmill that you can never get off of. At the same time, that gets really tiring. Like I've been doing it for 10 years and it's awesome and it's fun and it's amazing privilege. But when there is no end in sight, it's like, wow, you know, that's a, that's a long race to, to lead for the rest of my life. So I think it's unbelievably important that people listen to what you're saying here when you say, make sure that you have your end goal in mind, your three to five year plan, because we're all working the same amount of hours every day. We're all putting in the same amount of effort. But if you choose one destination or one path, that is a path that will never end and you will fall over dead out of exhaustion. And then there's the other path where, hey, there's a finish line and you can potentially sell the business for, you know, two, three, four, five, you know, X, which for me is a way to compress time. So let's just say if you do a, have a business that does a million dollars in revenue a year, and if you can sell it for $5 million, you've essentially just compressed five years and taken a time machine and taken back five years of your life that you can now go apply to something bigger, something better, something more fun, and, and maybe something with an even bigger reward or a bigger mission. And so that's kind of the epiphany that I've had over the last two years. And um, I, I see a lot of other people having it as well. And, and you're telling people to make sure that you put some time and thought strategically into what you're working on and what you want from this thing, you know, over the long term, which and I think how, is really important. Two things. One, um, you know, in that example, you're, you're 100 percent right. It's the only way to buy time. And I think you've been a million in earnings, not a million in revenue. Yeah. And, and, and so it's the only way that you can, you can really buy time. And, you know, you bring up, you, you bring up some really good points. And one of the things that's important for your listeners to realize and, and notice that when Mike talked about that, and, and essentially when he talked about how much wood can a woodchuck chuck, you know, the problem with that, that equation is woodchucks get tired. And that is really, uh, uh, that is really a voice of experience and something that I know in both of our 20s, we wouldn't have picked up on. And so it's figuring out, okay, and you, know, and you, you can sell your business, you just can't sell it for a big multiple of earnings. I mean, it's, you, know, you can sell it for six to 12 months work. Um, so you don't really own a business, you own a job. And many people don't realize the difference between owning a job and owning a business. And it's just as easy to create a business that you can sell 
as to create a business that you can't. So starting with a real clear understanding of what are people going to value at exit or what are the drivers of value. And that way you can focus on the things that are going to make the biggest difference when you go to sell. But you don't want to do your business for one year, three years, and five years, and then ask the question, what do I have? You know, that is the biggest mistake that I see people make. So if you don't know how your business is going to be valued, if you don't know what industry your business is considered to be in, if you don't know, you know, what your multiples of earnings or, or, or your drivers of value are, I mean, I'm sure you're going in the right direction, but you're going to want to get really clear on that very quickly so you can get a heading. Yeah, so absolutely agreed, man. So this has been super awesome, incredibly valuable in my in my humble opinion, uh, as our conversations always are. Where can people go to connect with you, follow you, keep up with what you are working on and, and rain catcher and all of that other good stuff? Absolutely. So, you know, valuations and, you know, our, our primary company is Raincatcher at raincatcher.com. But if someone wants to connect with me, uh, just go to roberthirsch.com. And, uh, you know, you can see exactly what we're up to. And uh, we send out weekly entrepreneurial advice and really bring people into the fold. And it's been really rewarding, just, just like what you've built here at, at Self Made Man. And before we wrap, Mike, I just want to commend you on, on being able to build what, in my opinion, is the best podcast out there, really around a set of values um, that's so near and dear to our heart, which I just think it's awesome. Yeah, well, it's been uh, it's been a ton of fun, and and the comments that people sit in, uh, you know, the reviews you guys leave on iTunes, I read all of those. I read all of the emails that you send into, uh, you know, my customer service team, and they forward those to me. So I read the blog post comments that you leave below the episodes. So even if I don't reply, I read them. So thank you guys so much for all of your support, and the ladies too. I know we've got a bunch of ladies who are huge fans of the show. I'm so glad that you're here and the value out of it. Uh, yeah, so thank you, brother. I appreciate it. And thank you all to, uh, to everybody out there who's been listening and, and sharing the, uh, the good word uh, you know, with everybody. It's been great. Thanks again, Mike. I really appreciate it. Awesome, brother. Well, Robert Hirsch, thank you so much, guys. Go check him out at roberthirsch.com. Uh, you know, one, he's one of the smartest people I've ever met in my entire life. And uh, it's the reason that I work with him and he's my best friend. So I uh, hope you enjoyed today's episode and stay tuned as always. We will be back next week with a brand new lesson for you. Take care.